Just off the island of Eleuthera, in the crystal blue waters of the Bahamas, a young man that grew up on these islands hearing tales of sunken ships, a would-be treasure hunter named Nick Malis, discovered a shipwreck full of treasure, not gold bars or silver coins, but an incredible array of fine English china and delicate porcelain figurines worth millions of dollars. We're right on top of the Baltic now. There's the mass. Under here like that lies a 127-foot brig. Just saying, here I am. Come and look for me. The year was 1866, and the Civil War had just ended. The Baltic, a U.S. merchant ship, had just returned from Europe to New York, her hull loaded with goods, along with china and tableware from some of the best factories in England. With the war over and the South in desperate need of medicine and supplies, the Baltic took on more crates of supplies and immediately set sail for Galveston, Texas. But the Baltic never made it. Three days into her voyage, she was caught in a tremendous hurricane and pushed out to sea. She came to rest in the waters off the island of Eleuthera, where Nick and his partner, Tim Brody, began piecing together clues as to the Baltic's whereabouts. The research that I get into, uh, which was basically the newspaper articles from the time, stated that there were over 2,000 lives lost. This was the worst hurricane to ever hit the Caribbean area. It lasted for four days. Right. Yes, I came across some of the same kind of stuff to where people were found stranded and naked, um, starving to death on little rock keys where their boats were destroyed and they were just washed up on these little keys. Yeah. People were being picked up all over the Bahamas like that. More than a hundred years later, Nick picked up the search for the ship itself. Well, I was born in Nassau and uh, grew up there and uh, we moved up here to Russell Island. We've been here, I guess, over nine years. And um, from the time I was in Nassau, I collected antique bottles and um, was fascinated with the history and all that kind of stuff. And started getting interested in shipwrecks. Okay. This is uh, the artifact garden. This is samples of different types of wrecks, different years and everything. Bits and pieces of ballast stones, bottles, pottery, iron spikes, all sorts of stuff. That was the old, the bottle tops and the bottoms is what I use basically to date the ship. It's, it's very important to find out what kind of date period you are with a shipwreck as soon as possible. So now the top of this bottle, see this brim that runs around? Yeah. That places the date of this bottle at 1650. So, and it's uh, in good condition. That means it was buried in the mud for a while. This is the clue signs that a ship is broken up in the area. And it's this type of stuff that makes a trail that you follow. You follow a trail of ballast stones or broken bottles, and it may lead you right to a shipwreck. Uh, this is the a trail to the Baltic was tough to follow. There was no debris trail, only a local legend and a scant few clues. Well, after doing surveys around and keeping my eye open for clues of shipwrecks, uh, I did come across the evidence of a piece of iron and a piece of wood sticking out of the sand there uh, on this interesting, very shallow sand bank. So I was very curious with that, and I spoke to old folks and got uh, rumors and stories that were passed down from generation to generation. Vessels being lost in a hurricane with, um, in the Civil War period. With the evidence and then the rumors, I said, that's got to be the Baltic, right there. Could it be? 130 years later, the wreck of the Baltic? Hundreds of miles off course and peeking out of the sand? I kind of sensed that it, it was uh, the rumored vessel for over three years, but it was difficult to get somebody to believe me because there's 200 feet off the beach, there's a piece of wood sticking out of sand. Who's gonna think anything's there? And n nobody's going to, unless you have some other kind of proof. Nick Malis knew in his heart something was down there, but proving it was not going to be easy. 
and realizing the monumental task ahead of him by working alone, in 1992, he convinced a team of treasure hunters to help him out. Their blowboat was positioned over the site, and by using a specially designed tool, the propeller wash is deflected downward and literally blows the sand away from the area. After blowing for only 15 minutes, when the sand cleared, they weren't prepared for what they saw. There she was, the Baltic, fully intact. I was one of the first ones down into the hull to explore it, and uh, there was a very peculiar hole down in the lower section of the ship. It was all dark in there, and I entered the hatchway and fell down, and as I got down inside, uh, a big burst of cold water shot up through, which was quite uh, spooky. You know, we didn't know whether spirits were in there, if somebody died, if there was a body in there. So naturally it was, uh, you know, quite shocking, enough to give you goose pimples. For 19 days straight, Nick and his divers were engulfed in treasure carefully bringing up thousands of artifacts. They were unpacking crate after crate that had been packed 130 years before and retrieving porcelain and fine china that were a century old and still brand new. It was quite a shock, you know, to see these things coming out intact and you know, not broken, you know, just, just like the, the day they was made. It's not a common shipwreck, it's a very rare find. For most ships, you just find a, a broken up scatter of pieces of china and ballast stones, and you gotta glue it all together and produce something to take pictures of. This is the best you could get. This is only a small sampling of the Baltic's treasure. An incredible selection of artifacts. Delicate glass, china, and porcelain. All extremely rare. We probably uh, have about 2,500, 3,000 pieces. We figure we've got about a quarter of the cargo. She'll probably have, uh, she'll probably have 10, 12,000 pieces on her. These are made by the Cape Cod Glass Company. According to the Corning Museum of Glass in New York, they've identified these for us. They were called a nappy, and they were used uh, as a butter dish. And uh, they're a beautiful piece. We have a few of those. We have 14 uh, Staffordshire manufacturers identified to date. This is uh, William Adams IV, and it's called the Columbia Series. Uh, the only other collection of the Columbia Series that we can find is a gentleman in Albany, New York. His family's been into the antique business for the past 200 years. Uh, he personally claims that he's been looking for another piece to add to his collection for 20 years, and he can't find one. So we have a lot of that. This is Jacob Furnival. Now, the only other collection of Jacob Furnival uh, known that we have been able to find out from Victoria Albert Museum, they have the only other collection that we know of. These are uh, called worm bowls, worm design. They're Staffordshire as well. We had heard that one of the small bowls sold years ago at another auction house, and uh, it had sort of surfaced and sold for $7,000. Uh, so we have, we have complete sets. Some of the most intricate and expensive items discovered inside the Baltic are these porcelain figurines. We believe that they were commissioned by the King of Bavaria in 1758 because we, in researching the patented numbers that were issued to certain people, the three numbered pieces that we have were all issued to the King of Bavaria. What are these pieces actually worth? Nick and Tim brought in an expert, Benny Fisher of Fisher Auction House, to appraise the Baltic's treasure. Uh, we're very excited about the cargo of the Baltic for many reasons. Uh, first of all, the Baltic is, uh, as I understand, the only uh, ship uh, in the Western Hemisphere that has ever been discovered fully intact. And all of the cargo that has thus far been raised uh, is in pristine condition. The porcelains were still packed uh, in their original crating in the straw that uh, was there to protect them from breakage. And as to the value, 
uh, nothing like this has ever been offered at public auction. Uh, precious metals and jewels have intrinsic value. Gold bullion is sold uh, and brings its value by virtue of its weight. But uh, the nature of these porcelains is such that um, having been off the market for literally 130 years, it could bring anywhere from 100,000 to a million dollars. But in my opinion, this is among the 10 or 12 more valuable pieces simply because of the scarcity and demand. We have uh, hundreds of uh, plates, et cetera, et cetera, but we only have about a dozen of these. And uh, this particular piece, I'm going to guess in our upcoming auction where we, we will be selling these artifacts, could bring anywhere from uh, probably uh, $1,000 or $1,500 to $25 or $30,000. For Nick Malis, finding the Baltic was a dream come true. A dream that changed the direction of his life. Now he's a full-time treasure hunter, finding and working wreck sites all through the Bahamas. But the site he returns to, and that is still giving up treasure, is the Baltic. was one of the first wrecks that I did open up and I guess that kind of spoils you you know to just jump right into one of the best that you could find uh, but it, it's enough to keep you going and you may be able to produce some type of wreck like it but maybe not another bullet. Even if he never finds another shipwreck as rich with treasure Nick Malis will always have these incredible days to remember the days he solved the mystery of the Baltic and opened her sunken treasure chest that was filled to the brim. Next, one of the first Mickey Mouse movie posters, auctioned off in an estate sale. 